In the Roman Empire, there was a thing called memento mori. And memento mori is a phrase that was said that means remember death. And it was spoken the most during a time when a victorious general was coming back into the capital city of Rome and celebrating the victory that this uh, Roman general had in conquering and in waging war against foreign opposition. And so there would be this huge spectacle and parade, right? If you're a Laker fan, you're used to that once they win the, uh, the, the championship, you know, downtown LA is, uh, you know, flooded, there's street closures, and, you know, they're all parading around it. If you're a Clipper fan, we don't know how that feels like, but we can assume and we could borrow from there and say, oh, that's what it must feel like to win and be victorious, right? So they had that in Rome, and it was done in a very celebratory, exciting way. In front of the, the general, so the general would stand right pad in the middle of this procession. In front of him was the gold that was captured, all the wealth that was ransacked from this foreign nation and all the captives of the soldiers that they have conquered going and proceeding before him. Behind the general was his victorious army, his army that he had commanded to victory. And so he's parading around down through the capital in Rome, and people that are just onlookers see this great glory, all this gold, all these captures, all these brave soldiers behind him, and they start shouting the general's name. It is a victorious, celebratory time. And yet, in that time, there is one aid that stands out amongst the rest. While everyone seems to be in celebratory mood behind the general, there is one Roman aide coming alongside the general, whispering to his ears as this whole array is going on, memento mori, memento mori, memento mori. That aide is there to remind the general that this fleeting feeling does not last. He may feel immortal, but he's not. General, remember, you're mortal. Remember, general, you will die. Remember, general, all this fanfare, all of this, uh, all of the pleasures of life, it is fleeting. General, remember death. Living in exile makes us forget about the reality of death. Our culture does not have language and the ability to talk about death well because it scares us. I don't know if you've read The Hunchback of Notre Dame, but the book ends with Quasimodo dying and for us feeling the grave injustice done to the Hunchback of Notre Dame and the cards that he was dealt. But if you were to ever watch the Disney movie, you know, with the talking gargoyles and all the you know, fanfare and the magic and stuff, Quasimodo lives, and they live happily ever after. Our culture does that all the time. We airbrush, airbrush talks of death with euphemisms. Oh, these just passed. He's just in the sky playing racquetball forever. We hide death away. It's funny enough, when people used to die, they used to die inside of their homes so that whoever their family was, whether young or old, they are met with the reality that we too will one day die and fade away. But now there's almost this unrealistic view of death or we try to hide away death where the majority of people die now in hospitals or hospices and it does not look natural at all. They're hooked up to all of these machines. We're not good about talking about death. And so because we don't talk about it, because we don't have the resource to share about it, we often need those reminders too. Memento mori, remember death. We're gonna talk about two people here today, both Esther and Haman, who are met with the reality of death while living in exile. It doesn't seem like death would be on the front doorstep because both of them are wealthy, both of them are powerful, both of them are the highest in terms of status that they could potentially be. And yet, we're going to look at how these two characters deal with impending death at their doorsteps. So we're going to look at Esther's plea for life as point number one. And then we're going to look at Haman's plea for life 
in point number two. We're going to look at Esther's plea for life and Haman's plea for life. And we're going to see that through the book of Esther, chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Turn with me there if you have your Bibles. Esther chapter 7, verses 1 through 10 is page 414 if you have a Bible from church. Esther chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Esther 7, verses 1 through 10. Stand if you're able with me out of reverence and respect for God's word. As we read Esther chapter 7, verses 1, all the way to verse 10, all together. This is the reading of God's word. So the king and Haman went into the feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and it pleases the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he, and where is he, who has dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe and enemy, the wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine, as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? As a word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house fifty cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. Amen. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. What do we learn about Esther's plea for life? We learn that we need to look at Esther's plea in two perspectives. Number one, the zoomed out perspective, God's perspective. And number two, the zoomed in perspective. What do I mean by the zoomed out perspective? We need to see that Esther's life was kept because of the sovereignty of God. Because God was in absolute control even when the odds were against him. Even when Esther felt impending death. Even when they're far away from the place of their upbringing in Jerusalem. Even in exile, God is directing, moving, and shaping things for his glory and for the good of his people. If you're to look at chapter 6, verse 13, these are the words echoed by Haman's wife who says, look, if Mordecai is a Jew, you're, gonna not be, you're not gonna be able to overcome him, but you will surely fall before him. Even in Zeresh's mind, who's not a Jew, who's married to Haman, this wicked guy, knew and understood that there's more than meets the eye as to what happens to this select group of people. All of the different world's powers that chose to subjugate them, to oppress them, to hurt, to kill, to commit genocide to them, never were successful. Whether it be the Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, the Canaanites, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and in standing right now, the Persians, you cannot go against God's people. God's divine sovereignty, how he's working for their good, is sustaining these people right now. When we zoom out, we can see why Esther has life. She's part of the people of God. No matter how far, no matter even the sins that she had committed, no matter all the wrongs that she had done, no matter how far she is from Jerusalem, 
No matter whether, the, whether to, to, to determine her last day of temple worship, there's no temple in Persia. You have to go to Jerusalem for that. And yet, in spite of all of those things, God's commitment to Esther and to his people still stands. When we zoom out, we see a sovereign God in control of life and death. And in Esther's viewpoint here, God has decreed, I choose life for Esther and for my people. But as we zoom in, Esther does not just rest on the laurels of her identity, her religion, or the promises made to her ancestors in the past. She doesn't let go and let God or let Jesus take the wheel. But instead, as we look into what Esther does, you start seeing how active, how responsive she is to make good on God's promise to keep her. She is active in using her wisdom, her relationship with the, the king, and her rhetoric in order to persuade the king to save her. We see this in Esther's short response, and I see four different ways that Esther hones in and actively participates in trying to preserve her own life while talking to the king. As we zoom in, we see Esther's perspective of how she tries to persuade the king to save her life. Number one, she's polite, she uses the right phrasing, and she waits for the right timing. Look down with me at chapter 7, verse 3. Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be granted me. This is almost verbatim to Esther's request in chapter 5, verse 8, which is the second time that the king asked this question, hey, Queen Esther, I love you so much. Hey, what do you want? What's your wish? What's your request? Even half to my kingdom, I'll give to you. And then Esther responds almost in the same way as, he, as she does in chapter, or chapter 7, verse 3, if I found favor in your sight, O king, except one small, subtle change. You see in chapter 5, verse 8, she responds to the king's request, hey, what's your request, what's your wish? Even half my kingdom I'll give to you. Chapter 5, verse 8, Esther says, if it pleases the king, if I have found favor with the king, but what do we see in verse 3? Esther answers, if I have found favor in your sight. The change from third personal to second personal pronoun may not seem like that big of a deal. And yet, we have to think about ourselves here today. Why didn't Esther jump at the opportunity from the very beginning to reveal that Haman was out for her life, that Haman had, had tried to commit genocide to her people? What's Esther doing but waiting for the right opportunity of meeting with the king, being in close proximity, being in the court first, being at the first feast, to where we find both Haman, the king, and Esther right now. This was a time to strike. This was a time to relate to the king, not with formal messaging, not with uh, the right kind of procedure or protocol of how to pronounce the king. It's time to say, hey, I'm your queen. You are my king. The phrasing of it shows that they indeed have a special relationship that may not have felt very close when she first entered the king's court, but sure feels close now that within the past couple of two days, they had already met three times. Notice the phrasing. Notice the timing that Esther chooses to use. Number two, she finds an opening to relate to the Jewish people. Notice in verse 2 that the king asks two questions, but they're basically the same question, right? What is your wish and what is your request? It's maybe just one of those ways that you just say the same thing, but you say it in a different way, it did not sound repetitive. But, the, but Esther uses this opportunity to pounce. Notice how she answers in verse 3. If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be granted for my wish and my people for my request. 
If you've studied with us through the book of Esther, we would still know that the king does not know that Esther is Jewish. Now, this could be a big deal because the king could have accused Esther, like, how, why would you make me look so silly or stupid in front of all these people? Why wouldn't you have just told me that you were Jewish from the beginning? But here, Esther finds the moment to strike. It seems like the king is only asking one question, but she makes it into two. For my wish, hey, let me live. And for my request, let my people live as well. She finds that perfect double dutch opportunity where she's waiting and abiding for her time to let the king know that I am Jewish. I am going to die if this uh, order or decree falls through. And here she finds the opening to say, if it's a threat to the Jews, it's a threat to me. Number three, where we see Esther working to preserve her life is that she is so careful not to accuse the king, but rather to put the blame on Haman. If you look at chapter 7, verse 3, she quotes Haman's decree verbatim. I'm sorry, verse 4, where it says, We have been sold, I and my people, and this is where she quotes it verbatim, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If you were to look at chapter 3, verse 13, these are the exact words that Haman uses when he tells the Persian Empire to kill the Jews, to destroy, to annihilate, to kill. The same exact way. This is not your fault, O king, even though you let this thing go, even though you gave Haman your signet ring, even though you didn't kind of look down and read the fine print of what Haman was trying to say, she's going to quote Haman's words, not the king's. And lastly, Esther appeals to the king's selfishness. What does she make this all about? Verse 4, for we've been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would not have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. What's Esther saying here? She can't appeal to genocide. The king thinks that genocide is okay. What does she choose to appeal to but the king's own selfishness? In verse 4, she's saying, look, if we were just being enslaved, I wouldn't bother you with this. This wouldn't be that big of a deal. Yeah, it's a big deal for us, but it's not a big deal to you, oh great king. But hey, this would be a big loss to you. That's how she ends verse 4, right? This would be a big loss to you, king, if you had just lost your favorite queen. And that's why I bring it up to you. Because you wouldn't want to lose your favorite queen, right? What do we see here but Esther using her relationships, using the correct timing, using the right rhetoric and words to move the king towards compassion to her and anger towards Haman. Esther has set the perfect trap and it was brewing and settling from chapter 4. Now it has fully come to roost in chapter 7. And as we read on in verses 5 to 6, Esther is victorious. She manipulates and moves the king into the right way where Haman himself, the second in command, the king's right-hand man, is trapped. Verse 5, the king is furious. Who is he? And where is he? Who has dared to do this? And this must be one of those like awkward times. I don't know if you have those awkward times at Thanksgiving with your family where it gets really quiet on the dinner table, but it's just the three of them. The king's furious and Esther looks over to the table, points to Haman and says, a foe and an enemy, the wicked Haman. And everyone's like shocked, like, oh my gosh, this is about to go down. It is crazy. And that's what happens. Haman's trapped and the king is furious. What do we learn about life and death in exile? There's divine responsibility. There's divine sovereignty. I'm sorry. There's divine sovereignty as we zoom out. God is in complete control. And yet, there's also human responsibility. Both of these two truths work in tandem with one another. When we zoom out, we see God working behind the scenes, orchestrating, moving things so that it would all be accomplished according to his plan. But when we zoom in, we see Esther working diligently, using all the mental, emotional resources that she can to preserve her own life. We see divine sovereignty and human responsibility working in coexistence. These two truths can coexist together. But so many times, especially as we talk about it in church or maybe in philosophy class, it seems as though these two ideas conflict, that there's divine sovereignty and human responsibility. 
I love this interaction between a theologian by the name of A. A. Hodge. He was a Princeton theologian and father and son of a famous uh, Reformed theologian, Charles Hodge. And he had this interaction with one of his students about this idea of divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Note the interaction between the two. The student asks, does God know the day that you will die? Yes. Has he appointed that day? Yes. Can we do anything to change that day? No. Then why do we eat? To live. What happens if we don't eat? You die. Then, if you don't eat and die, would that be the day that God had pre-appointed for you to die? Quit asking stupid questions and just eat. Because eating is the preordained way that God has appointed for living. God has appointed the day that you and I die. But you and I got to eat. God will save and preserve his people. But Esther's got to work. God has promised that every tribe and tongue will be with him in heaven. But we got to go out to missions and share the gospel with them. God has designed Christian marriage to reflect the gospel. But wives and husbands need to play in complementary roles to display that truth. God promises that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ, not even death. But you and I need to put on the armor of God daily so that we would be able to stand in this present day. Divine sovereignty human responsibility, coexisting and working together. At a church like this, we tend to maximize divine sovereignty and minimize our human responsibility. We make excuses about why we don't read the Bible, why we sin, knowing that God will forgive us in the end, why we don't do difficult things. Well, if God wanted me to, he would have put me in that position. He would have made it clear to me. Stop making stupid excuses, and do the work God had commanded you to do. Do what the Lord had pre-appointed for you as you read his word. What are your responsibilities? Where is God's, where's divine sovereignty? How do these two truths coexist together? We search the scriptures and see those truths in our daily life. Do not maximize divine sovereignty and minimize human responsibility. They are not seesaws where one rises up and the other goes down, but rather they coexist perfectly together in exile. Do what the Lord has pre-appointed for you to do and watch and see how his will will work through it. This is what we see from Esther's life. As we zoom out, we see God working behind the scenes, starting from a sleepless night with the king and arranging the death of Haman in the right and proper place and time. But it took Esther's human responsibility to use her relationships, her words, and the right timing in order to achieve those things herself. This is what we learn from Esther but what do we learn from Haman? In Haman's life, we see two things about what can blind us to the reality of death. And as we look down from verses 6 through 10, we see the demise of Haman. Haman doesn't go in verse 7 after the king, but who does he plead with? Who does he bow down to? He bowed down to Esther in verse 8, falling and pleading for his life while the king takes a rest and a reset over at the palace garden. We find ourselves in a silly situation where Haman is begging Esther for his life. And the king comes in just at the opportune moment. And what does the king see? Not just that Haman was revealed to try to kill his favorite wife, his queen, but now what looks to be on the, on the surface, Haman trying to violate, grope the queen. In Haman's mind, he's just trying to beg for the life, please save me, please save me, please save me. But as the king comes back from the garden, he sees Haman's hands all over his favorite queen. If the king was mad before, 
Now he's at a 10. Verse 8. Will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? Then as we see in verse 9, one of the eunuchs that were with him, Harbona, because the king can't think for himself, suggests to the king, hey, there's a gallow over there, this huge colossal gallow made by Haman to kill Mordecai. The Mordecai, that guy that saved you. How about because of what Haman did, you hang you hang Haman on that. This pleased the king. They killed Haman. And the wrath of the king had abated as it concludes in verse 10. We are meant to laugh at the irony as to what happened to Haman. A gallo prepared to hang his nemesis Mordecai is now being used to hang Haman. Not only that, this whole situation was caused because Mordecai, the Jew, would not bow down to him. And then who do we see bowing down to who at the conclusion of Haman's life? We see Haman bowing down to Esther. The sweet irony, the poetic justice that is done as we look at Haman's terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day come to fruition. Haman exchanges place with Mordecai he is hung while Mordecai is set free. It's easy to caricaturize Haman because he falls down so extremely and so quickly. It's easy to think about, well, that will never happen to me. What a crazy turn of events. Just within the span of a day, Haman goes from royalty to rejection from the king, where he goes from honor to death. Maybe it's one of those examples that are set to scare us straight, to show us the extremes of life and say, well, beware, you know, this is what happens to the worst of people. But this isn't like us, right? We don't, we're not going to be in that position. We're not going to die this kind of gruesome, quick death in the same ironic way that Haman did. It's so easy to play armchair quarterback as we watch Haman's life unfold. If you've ever watched like a scary movie, I don't like watching scary movies, but when I used to like watching scary movies, I would make all of these like comments either audibly or just in my mind because you make so many stupid, stupid decisions when you're in a scary movie, right? You know, it's like dark and somehow the main protagonist thinks, oh, it's a good idea for me to go alone. Oh, my flashlight's not working. That's all right. Don't go there. You're going to die, you know? Or it's like, you know, they're like, there's a creepy room that's like just slowly blowing wind. And the protagonist moves towards that room. It's like, what are you doing? There's something behind that door. Or the protagonist like looks at all these creepy things and he picks up like the creepy dolls. Like, oh my gosh, don't, you could have picked up any other doll in the store. You just chose to pick up the creepy doll that's like spewing out vomit. And so you're saying, and you're like, how could you be so blind? How could you be so dense? Don't you know what's about to happen? And we could think that looking at the story of Haman. We look at Haman and we say, Haman, don't brag about yourself. All of the things that you want is going to be given to Mordecai. Haman, don't build that gallow. That's going to be for you, not for Mordecai. Haman, don't go into that banquet. They're trying to kill you. And over and over and over again, Haman is so blind, obtuse, to what is actually going to happen. It is so comical for us to see he, that he is so blinded as to what are the events that are about to happen. But friends, you and I are just like Haman in that. We too are blinded by the two different ways that Haman was blinded to his choices and to his impending death. Number one, Haman and us we're blinded by our own sin. We're blinded by our own sin. We cannot look beyond the sin that we're committing in this life. We look at the sin and we don't see beyond that. We don't see the consequences of that. Haman thought, I'm gonna live in a way that's prideful, that's filling myself 
that is vengeful and vindictive, and I don't see anything wrong with that. I'm going to live in my sin and not think about the consequences. Friends, that is just a ploy of Satan, that he will show us the bait and hide the hook. He will make us blind to what is behind that tantalizing thing, that thing that we're drawn to, that we are promised pleasure, joy, and happiness, but we do not see the hook. That is exactly how sin chooses to blind Haman and exactly the way that sin chooses to blind us. All we see is the bait of a night out with friends, getting drunk, being lost in the moment, and we are so blind to the hook that our impairment, our, in our drunkenness, the choices, words, and actions that we do as we're impaired and drunk can cause serious problems to our lives and to others. We see the attraction, the bait of casual sex. It's, we love each other. We're attracted to each other. It's consensual. What is so wrong with that? And yet casual sex hides the hook of destroying our integrity in our relationship or in shipwrecking our future intimacy with our future spouse. This is Satan's deal all the time. He'll show you the bait. He'll hide the hook. You and I can be blind to the consequences of our death because we do not see beyond our own sin. We do not see beyond our own sin. And that might be obvious to us. And you've come here to say, okay, Pastor Charlie, you're a pastor. That's Captain Obvious. We're going to be blinded by our own sin. But there's another thing that Haman was blinded by. He was not just blinded by his sin. Haman was blinded by his success. He was blinded by his success. These things couldn't happen to me. I'm not going to die from high heights. Look, the king and queen invited me personally into their, into their place. Only I and I alone. Look, I'm the right-hand man of the king. I have his signet ring. I have his authority and power over me. I'm wheeling and dealing. I have job security. I have peace. I have the right relationships. I'm going to live long and prosper in this life. Look at my achievements, my accomplishments, my attributes, my accolades. Of course, I'm going to live a long life. Friends, whenever we hang on to in this life that, think, that we think that our accomplishments, our abilities, and our achievements, that these are guarantees of a long, successful life, it's fool's gold. We may think that we're relatively secure because of our 401k. We may think that we're re relatively secure because we have the right relationships. Maybe we think that we're relatively secure because we have the right kind of job. But that's fool's gold. That's false security. That's like hanging on to a small inflatable paddle while a tsunami is coming and saying, this is going to save me. This is going to keep me afloat. As long as I hold on to this, I have security. How blinded we can be to the fragility of our own life by the success, achievements, and accomplishments that we have in this life. Friends, this is a good time for us to memento mori, to remember our own death, whether you're a Christian or not, because death can happen to us all. It is a reality that you and I do not get to pick. And the more successful we can become, the more we may forget how fragile, how weak we genuinely are. This reality, uh, I read it in a book, uh, When Breath Becomes Air, and it's an autobiography about a guy named Paul Kalanithi. It's a, it's a great book. I really enjoyed reading it. Uh, long ago. And, you know, Paul Kalanithi, Kalanithi, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, but it's an autobiography. And he was a, a top brain surgeon at Stanford, very accomplished. He was the top of his profession. And he records that early in his life that he was a firm atheist. He thought that he could make sense of the world through his reasoning, through his ability, until at the age of 35, that it all came to a crashing halt 
when he was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer out of the blue. Through the book, you see in Paul's autobiographical account, his posture change from proud to humble, to acknowledging that as he was on top of the world, it can all come crashing down in a matter of moments. By the end of the book, he acknowledges his limitations and weakness. He can no longer hide behind achievements and accomplishments any longer. And neither can we, no matter how successful, no matter if we make it in this life or not. You see, this series is entitled Living in Exile. It's not talking about thriving in exile. That's not a series that's from the Bible. Because thriving in exile will look like having the right job, the right opportunity, the right relationships. And that is exactly what Haman had. And yet, look at where he stands. Look at how fleeting, how weak all of those things were at the very end of his life. You and I need to learn how to navigate through exile because there are pitfalls, there's pathways to destruction, and some of them, my friends, are lined with gold. Some of them will be on the way towards success, achievement, and accomplishment, and that could be what blinds you to your very own weakness and finitude. What do we learn from exile? God preserves life, sustains life, and we work in conjunction with him. Do not be blind to the reality of death by your own sins and by your own success. It may look like Haman got a bad rap and it was a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day that just happened to him. But these were building in his character all the time. Every time he acted out in sin, every time he acted against God and his people, every time he chose to not do what was right, but to continue in his own foolishness, he was building a case. He was building up the wrath of God till God finally said, enough. Friends, if you and I are in this journey, thinking that we can get away with sin, thinking that death is not at our doorstep, we're so glad that you are here today. As a warning and as a reminder of memento mori, remember death, it will happen to us all. Who controls death in this text here today? Who is the giver of life? And who is the take, and who gives away death in this text? It's the unjust king Ahasuerus, this should worry us because what we know about the king is not good. The king is ignorant, shallow, and fickle, and he is weak. He's manipulated to do Esther's bidding just as he was manipulated by Haman, just as he was manipulated by the other people inside of his court earlier on. The king only acted in a way that was self-serving to him out of his own personal interest. And yet, this is the person that Haman chose to put his trust in. Do we all meet with the same fate? Is the earthly king the only king that you and I can trust? If you are a believer here today, the good news is that you and I do not have to subjugate ourselves to this king, but rightly, and praise God for this, we can subjugate ourselves to the one true king the living God who reigns and rules over all of his creation. God, unlike Haman, doesn't need to be manipulated or cajoled to doing what is right. God is the embodiment of righteousness. He always does right because that is in his character. He is always righteous. He loves us. And he wants to offer us life. He even sent his one and only son to be impaled on the gallows for us so that we could taste the life that he had taken away 
from his own son. John 3, 16 said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, so that what? So that we might have everlasting life in his name. John 10, 10, Jesus comes and says, This is the reason why I came. I came to give life and life in abundance. You get the life and I'll pay your debt on the gallow. That is the loving exchange, the mercy and the kindness. Not because we manipulated God, not because we cajoled him the right way, not because we said the right prayers or did the right things. It is out of God's own love and mercy to us that you and I can have life. Why would you not trust in this king? Why would you not bow the knee to his mercy and love, especially in comparing him to the other kings that exist in this world? If you are not a believer here today and you feel trapped, you recognize your own frailty, you know that the way you're going on leads to a path of destruction that will inevitably come unless you turn your knee or you bow the knee to Jesus Christ. He has come to give you life. And no matter how far you have been away from God, if you only turn and believe, you can have life in his name. We praise God for the hope that we have in Jesus. And I want to tell you, brothers and sisters in Christ, if you are a believer here in this room, we do not have to fear death any longer. The sting of death has been fully paid for by Jesus. He took the gallows for us. Because what's so scary about death? Well, some of us might say just the, the nature of it. We don't, know, um, we don't know when it is or how painful it is. And I bet many of us wish that the Christian message was that God's going to tie a sweet knot and you're going to die at the right time. You're going to go into sleep. It's going to be painless. It's going to be at the right time when you accomplish your bucket list of things that you want to do on this earth, all because you said, I believe and love Jesus. There's no Bible verse that guarantees that. And even our Lord and Savior himself died a gruesome, painful, humiliating death on the cross. God doesn't promise when or how we die, but God does promise what's going to happen after. And that's where the real sting is. Because if our death is our pathway towards eternal life or eternal destruction, that's the issue that you and I should care about the most. That should be the thing that gives us the most anxiety. Not how I will die, but where will I spend the rest of eternity? But the good news for you and me that when we go through death, 1 Corinthians chapter 50, verses 50, 15, verses 50 to 57, Paul says death has lost its sting. We are victorious in Christ. Death has lost its sting. Because if the issue about death, what we should be fearful about death, not when and how, but where we'll spend eternal life, we have that guarantee. We have that assurance because Jesus died and he rose again. We know that God's going to make good on his promise because as he resurrected Jesus, we have that resurrected promise too. We have the assurance that God's payment for sin has been made in full. Jesus fully paid the punishment of our sins because he was raised to life in victory. He has fully paid for our, the cost of our sin. The resurrection is the receipt paid in full with your name on it. Jesus has fully paid for the cost of your sin. Jesus' resurrection is our guarantee that we will have everlasting life with God for eternity. This is good news. The sting of death is gone because of Jesus. If you are a believer here today, there still is scary, scary feelings, thoughts, anxiety about death but we as Christians should never have the anxiety of where we'll be when we die. In a, in a funny way of providence, I was driving my daughter back from 
school to home my firstborn daughter, and out of the blue, she asked me, Appa or Dad, do bad people go to hell? And that, I was driving, but I almost turned my car into the street, like, oh my gosh. And I, I was almost going to kick it to the, you know, kick the ball down the field. I was like, oh, you know, that's a great question. You should ask your mom, right? But then I had a gut check time. I said, hey, Charlie, you can do this. You went to seminary. You can do this. You're made for this. And so I said, okay, here we go, right? Here we go. Topic about hell. I said, well, Ali, not bad people go to hell because good people don't go to heaven. All of us are bad. All of us do wrong. Who's in hell are those people whose sins are not forgiven. Those who get to go to heaven is not because they're good. It's because Jesus took the sting of death for us. That is what happens. And that's the assurance that we can have. The sting of death is gone because Jesus fully paid the punishment for our sins. I'll close with one last illustration. There's a pastor by the name of Donald Gray Barnhouse who was pastor at 10th Presbyterian Church for many years. During this time, he had lost his wife when his daughter was still a child. Dr. Barnhouse was trying to help his little girl and himself process the loss of his wife and her mother. Once when they were driving, a huge moving van passed them. As it passed the shadow of the truck swept over the car. The minister had a thought. He said something like this, would you rather be run over by a truck or by its shadow? His daughter replied, by the shadow, of course, that can't hurt us at all. Barnhouse replied, right, if the truck doesn't hit you, but only its shadow, then you are fine. Well, it was only the shadow of death that went over your mother. She's actually alive, more alive than we are. And that's because 2,000 years ago, the real truck of death hit Jesus. And because death crushed Jesus and we believe in him, now the only thing that can come over us is the shadow of death. And the shadow of death is but my entrance into glory. Let's pray.